The Mesozoic Era was a world of reptiles, as massive dinosaurs dominated terrestrial ecosystems, flying pterosaurs filled the skies, and marine reptiles patrolled the seas. However, numerous other animal lineages also shared this ancient earth, and it was during the Mesozoic that our own fluffy little ancestors, the mammals, first appeared. Discoveries in recent decades have revealed that, contrary to what was often portrayed in older media, the mammals that coexisted with the dinosaurs were not all tiny creatures confined to the shadows. Rather, they were incredibly diverse, with many different lineages occupying various niches in this ancient world. One particularly remarkable group of mammals was the order called Multituberculata, Quite rodent-like creatures that became very diverse towards the end of the Age of Dinosaurs, survived the mass extinction, and continued to live on until they all died out just over 30 million years ago. Well, a remarkable new species of multituberculate mammal has just been published by researchers at the University of Portsmouth here in the UK, the university I went to. Paleontologist Ben Weston, currently a master's student at the university, discovered this new Cretaceous species while carrying out fieldwork along the coastline of Dorset, and it was quickly realised that something very special had been found. Recently, I had the chance to sit down with Ben and chat about this incredible new species. So, cool. Hello, Ben. Hello, how are you? Ben. How are you, Ben? I'm not that bad, Ben. How are you, Ben? I'm all right, Ben. Yeah. Excellent. So, I hear you've got a, a new mammal. Ben, I have to, indeed, uh, Ben. Talk to us about. Right. Very good. So first of all, uh, I just want to ask you, what is a multituberculate mammal? Multituberculates are basically the Mesozoic equivalent of rodents. Um, so the earliest fossils that we have are from the Middle Jurassic, um, from the UK, Russia, Germany. Um, but they probably originated a bit earlier than this because these are already pretty well established as multituberculates. Um, they continued throughout the Mesozoic. They lived past the extinction that killed off the dinosaurs and they eventually died out. They were outcompeted by other mammals, um, like rodents, during the Oligocene. So how old is this fossil that you've discovered? Um, it's from the very beginning of the Cretaceous, so around 140 million years old. 140 million years ago, this part of Dorset would have been covered by a freshwater lagoon and would have had a much warmer climate than today. The multituberculate, which has been given the name Novoculodon mirabilis, was discovered in rocks that are part of the geological group known as the Purbeck, and when it existed, it would have lived alongside a whole host of other incredible prehistoric organisms, including a wide variety of other little mammals that were becoming very diverse at this time. So, probably the most interesting thing about the Purbeck is its small mammal assemblage. So it's not just multituberculates, but a variety of other Mesozoic mammalian forms, none of them particularly large. Um, but if we look at any sort of bigger forms, this was kind of a lagoonal area um, that sort of periodically dried out. So we've got things like pterosaurs and pterosaur tra trackways, uh, turtles are quite common, um, these fish, uh, crocodilians, and also quite rare dinosaur footprints. Um, so there would have been some theropods roaming around, some sauropods, that sort of thing. And so what's the story behind how you discovered the fossil? So I was basically just walking on this beach in Swanage, right? I was there for field work for the third year dissertation. I had like a specimen of a pterosaur um, that I was just sort of going to collect environmental data for. Um, and on the very last day, in literally the last hour I was on the beach, I sort of came across this big block um, and just poking out of it was the specimen. Um, so I just gave it the top of the rock a tap and it just fell out straight into my hand. This miraculous discovery was soon realised to be from a small multituberculate, and further examination also showed that it was unlike any known before. Ben had discovered a new prehistoric mammal species. So from the Lulworth Formation, which is where this specimen is from, um, multituberculates are the most common mammal. There's not very many of them, this is only the 10th species to come out of the Purbeck group, but it is the first species known from a jaw since Victorian times. Um, multituberculates are fairly distinctive. We've got this. Uh, this is a 3D print of the jaw um, at about 10 times magnification. If we start from the front of the jaw here, um, it's a lower jaw specimen. Um, this bit is the incisor, um, and you can see it's quite crushed if we look at it from here. Um, but it is distinctly very, very thick, and it's really a lot less protuberant than you see in other specimens. So a lot of the time, the incisor will point out like this, at sort of this angle. Um, but this one is going pretty much straight up, and the entire build of the jaw actually is very robust. 
Um, if we sort of move up the jaw, we've got the premolar series preserved here. This is the second, third, and fourth premolar. And the fourth premolar is what this animal is named after. Novoculodon means razor tooth. Um, and this is a really distinctive kind of square shaped, rectangle shaped uh, tooth. And if you can, if the camera picks it up, um, there are eight little notches at the top of the tooth here, the entire premolar series. And that is distinct among pelagiolacid multituberculates, which is the line that this one belongs to. At the back of the jaw here, you can see the vacuities where the two molars would have been. Um, this is where multituberculates actually get their name. So multituberculate means multiple tubercles. Um, and that is because the molars have these little nodges on them. Nibs, nibules, nibules, little nibules on them. Uh, and they are quite distinctive among all allotherian mammals, which is the group that multituberculates belong to. A lot of the anatomy of this fossil was able to be studied thanks to the digital scanning techniques that we use to analyse this amazing specimen without risking any damage to the actual jaw itself. We also spoke to Dr. Roy Smith, another of the paleontologists involved in the description of Novoculodon, to find out how they went about doing this. So the fossil is, is quite a fragile fossil, uh, so we didn't really want to prepare it and remove any of the matrix from the rock, so we, we, from the specimen. Um, so it was quite difficult uh, to prepare, so we decided in order not to damage it at all, we would CT scan it. Uh, so we CT scanned it at a super high resolution, taking loads of slices uh, of, the, of the fossil to see both its internal structure and also to digitally remove the rock so we didn't have to prepare the fossil then. Uh, and once we've got this CT uh, scan data, we compile this into a, a 3D digital model, which you can see in the paper. You can see all those really nice, uh, pretty, uh, pretty pictures of the, of the uh, specimen uh, with all the rock removed. So you can see all the surface detail, but also the internal structure as well. And what we managed to do from that as well is extract all of the teeth digitally so we could see uh, the roots of the teeth without actually having to remove uh, the teeth from the actual specimen. Absolutely amazing technology, amazing that we can do this now uh, and it makes it really really cool and really uh, easy for paleontology. It's, uh, it, it, it really is great when you can do that and not have to prepare a fossil and risk damaging it, especially when they're so fragile and it's a few millimetres uh, thick. I was a little bit scared to, to prepare it to be honest, so it's not something I really wanted to do. The incredible preservation, combined with the high-resolution digital scans of the Novoculodon jaw, allowed Ben and colleagues to learn more about this little beast's interesting anatomy and how it might have fed. Uh, because the jaw is so robust, this was probably feeding on a lot more tougher foods than a lot of other multituberculates that we see in the Purbeck group, or in the UK as a whole. And the teeth are also, the premolar series, are also quite thick um, when you look at them from this angle. Um, so this was probably feeding on things like, like seeds and nuts and berries and tubers, um, but also insects and other little grubby things as well. Um, as you go later into the evolution of multituberculates throughout the Cretaceous, they kind of radiate into these forms with much more enlarged fourth premolars. They kind of form this like circular saw shape, taking up much of the lower jaw. Um, and these things were feeding on leaves, um, and other sorts of things. And that's the predominant form of multituberculate. Um, but these earlier forms were much more omnivorous, uh, much more generalist animals. Another incredible detail that the CT scans revealed was just how far back within the jaw the incisor actually extends. This tooth curves under and back through the jaw all the way past the other teeth, and ends just after where the second molar would have been. Because the back of the tooth root does not taper off significantly and stays quite wide, this indicates that the incisor would have been continuously growing throughout much of this animal's life. Multituberculates in general did not have ever-growing teeth like modern rodents, but Novoculodon is one of a few known species that seem to have had lower incisors that kept on growing for a long time. As part of this publication, a paleoartistic reconstruction of Novoculodon was also created by fellow Portsmouth University graduate Hamza Imran, who you may also remember from our Bonehead series over on the Benji Thomas channel. Hamza's artwork is absolutely stunning and beautifully illustrates the interesting dental anatomy of this mammal. Considering that only the jaw of Novoculodon is known, how did he work with Ben and Roy to develop an idea of what the entire animal might have looked like? Okay, so the reconstruction that Hamza produced um, was based on a range of different multituberculates. Uh, they are notoriously 
quite fra uh, fragmentary in terms of their fossil record. Uh, lots of them are based on just on teeth and just on jaw fragments, so it's quite difficult to, to reconstruct what they looked like. Luckily, we have some more complete specimens uh, from other deposits. There's some deposits in China uh, which have complete specimens uh, where you can see the whole animal, the whole skull, so you can base what we have on on those and sort of fit that in and sort of do a little a little bit of a, a, a mix a, a mix and a, a match of of different animals and just include our jaw and our features of our jaw in a complete um, a complete animal based on other fossils. Novaculodon mirabilis is an incredibly significant find in the way it has furthered our knowledge of the mammals that lived at this time in the age of the dinosaurs, with implications for the diversity and evolution of the long-lasting multituberculate lineage. So, because this is quite a well-preserved specimen um, in terms of what we've got for multituberculates, most specimens of mammals in general from this time are only known from the teeth. Um, there was a study in 2017 of another Portsmouth uh, alumnus, I think he was, Grant Smith, um, and he found two species of mammal from the Purbeck, and they were just molars, um, and that was like a really good discovery. Um, so this really is quite important for Mesozoic mammal um, paleontology as a whole, especially considering there aren't really many uh, Mesozoic mammal sites worldwide, and this really increases the diversity of multituberculate remains that we have. <laughs> so why do you think it is that so many of these small mammals are basically just being found as teeth and sometimes jaws? Well, they're quite delicate little things. Um, this specimen, the actual thing, is only about 16 and a half millimetres long. Um, so if you're sort of picturing it in this like lagoonal environment where, you know, tides are coming in and out, there's dinosaurs stomping about, they're going to get disarticulated quite quickly. Um, teeth are quite robust in the fossil record. Um, we tend to find a disproportionate amount of teeth generally because um, they're covered in enamel. So predominantly you're finding these teeth. Um, jaws are a bit rarer, but also it is in these mammals one big bone. It's just the dentary. So it's a lot less likely to sort of fall apart than the rest of the postcranial skeleton, which is, you know, you've got all sorts of ribs vertebrae and things that are you know, liable to disarticulation. Novaculodon really is a spectacular discovery, and Ben and the team have done such a brilliant job of describing this little mammal. Thanks to Ben's find, we now know even more about the multituberculates of early Cretaceous England, and how these diverse, rodent-like creatures were feeding in different ways. So this discovery really is a fantastic, uh, fantastic fossil and a super rare one. When Ben showed me it, I really was amazed by it. Uh, I'd been down there actually quite recently uh, and there'd been a, a rock fall actually after I'd gone so Ben was really lucky to find this. It was a fantastic specimen that he, uh, he, he did discover and not one uh, that happens uh, very often. It's one that was, uh, there hasn't been a discovery like this uh, in the Purbeck region from these, these rocks since Victorian times. Uh, so it really is a lucky and a fantastic discovery that Ben made. Thank you so much to Ben and Roy for answering our questions, and a huge congratulations to Ben and the whole team for the publication of this paper. I hope you enjoyed learning about this brilliant discovery from the paleontologists themselves. We're hoping to do more videos like this in future, so please let us know if you enjoyed this special feature. Be sure to email us at 7 .stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Kang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drav Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giortist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Preprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikus, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Week.